Right. Well, let's pray. We're in uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 32. Going to look at uh, Peter's attitude adjustment. Father, we do come before you, and we know you can use what was meant for evil for good. And so we pray that even the uh, millions of people that will watch that Noah film will get an interest and open a Bible or ask a Christian to find out if uh, that was the real story. Is that how it really went down? Lord, so we pray you'd use it to, uh, to that end, to your glory. And uh, certainly continue to pray for the other film, Lord, that it would uh, touch lives across our country, encourage uh, believers. Lord, and we just want to now commit uh, our time to you to study your word, to receive from it a uh, story we may be familiar with. But Lord, we pray that uh, you'd help us by your spirit make the application here at the end that is so necessary in our own lives. We all need an attitude adjustment once in a while. It's not just our kids when they're having a bad day. It's, uh, it's us adults as well. So, Lord, may we uh, learn from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I, I can't help but, uh, you know, cover this story because we're, we're dealing with Peter now here in the book of Acts and God working in his heart, uh, making these changes. And, uh, and we've already talked about uh, some of those. Uh, and, of course, uh, God is not only working in his heart, uh, but God is dealing with with a man named Cornelius that we're going to be introduced to, uh, a Roman centurion, uh, a devout man, a man that was uh, the equivalent in rank to, uh, to an NCO in our military today. Uh, they were the backbone of the Roman uh, military, uh, as those guys are uh, uh, in our uh, armed uh, forces today. Amen? Amen. <laughs> We've got one right there. Yeah, so this guy's probably like a staff sergeant, master sergeant, something like that. Uh, a devout man, we're going to be uh, introduced to, uh, to him. Uh, but the whole point is God is working uh, in Peter's heart, this good kosher Jew, uh, to somehow get him uh, into a Gentile home, which was forbidden, uh, so that he might share the gospel. And he's working uh, at both ends at the same time. Uh, and even though I, I do uh, mention it uh, uh, may, may, you know, periodically, it, it, it certainly parallels the way God has worked uh, around the world, and certainly in terms of the history of Christianity uh, here in Hawaii as well. Uh, 1808, a young man named Henry Opokaia dives in the waters uh, off Kealakakua Bay uh, with a friend. They swim out to a, a whaling ship, uh, and they begin an adventure that leads them to eventually to uh, New England, uh, where he comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, his uh, heart is broken to think that the people back uh, in the islands I uh, have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he studies. Uh, he eventually learns Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Begins translating uh, 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 the scriptures, the New Testament, into Hawaiian. Develops a, a written language and a primer so others could uh, learn to read and write so they could study the scriptures. Uh, writes his own memoirs, which are available today that uh, you can pick up. Uh, and, uh, and eventually shares his testimony and preaches in many uh, of the uh, churches in the New England area, uh, gets influenza, dies at the age of 26. Uh, there's another group of uh, young men and women in their early 20s, though, that have read his memoirs. Uh, they kind of catch the vision uh, to bring the gospel to the Hawaiian Islands, uh, and they, uh, about 1820, board a ship uh, and set out to do that. They could not know what was taking place in the Hawaiian Islands at that time. Kamehameha dies. His son becomes King uh, Liholiho. He has been waiting for the opportunity to return to the God, singular, of his forefathers. Uh, he does that. He knows that there is, uh, uh, at one time, the Hawaiians worshiped the one true God who was the creator over all, uh, who was a God of love, and they want to return. Uh, with the encouragement of the high priest at that time, Heva Heva, and Queen Ka'ahumanu, uh, they basically burn down all the heiaus uh, in Hawaii. And they begin to pray to the one true God that someone would come to them and bring them the message of how they could know him uh, and love him uh, and have a relationship with him. These, these group of young 20-year-olds uh, uh, sail, arrive into the shores of Kailua Kona. They come and they say, we're here to tell you about the one true God who's a God of love. He's the creator God. There's no one more powerful than him. 
and you can know him through his son, Jesus Christ. They, I'm not sure if they said hallelujah in Hawaiian or not, but they said something probably, and uh, because God had been faithful working at both ends. And of course, the, as we, uh, we know, then uh, they, they beca readily became Christians as well as a lot of the Ali'i, and there was a revival that spread to uh, the Hawaiian kingdom. Uh, the kingdom of Hawaiian for a period of time was a, a Christian kingdom. They sent missionaries uh, out, young Hawaiians throughout the South Pacific, uh, and at that time, the church in Hilo had over 26,000 members, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, other things took place in terms of literacy rates and, uh, and so forth uh, here in the islands. Uh, but God working at two different ends, people being obeying to what God was showing them and telling them, not knowing the, uh, the end results. And that's very much what we have in, uh, in this story here. Uh, again, the mindset, though, of Peter uh, in the uh, first century church here, uh, we've got uh, uh, Samaritans that have come to faith in Christ that Peter uh, and John went up to check out, uh, a group of people that they resented, maybe even hated, uh, and, uh, and yet here they are. Uh, they've come to Christ. The Holy Spirit has come upon them. Uh, and we noted in that text, in that study, how uh, Peter and John went up there really kind of to investigate and check out what was going on there with Philip. But on the way back, they preached in every, every village they, they went through. Uh, God had used what we might call a short-term mission trip uh, to change their heart and, uh, and give them a heart for a group of people they never even considered uh, sharing the love of Christ with uh, before. Uh, God's still been working. It's been several years. And, uh, and now uh, the Lord is going to work through the heart of Peter. Uh, and we say first that uh, he's going to change his attitude uh, through a change of environment. Uh, and that's in verse 32. Again, we're in chapter 9, kind of one of those unfortunate chapter breaks. And we'll continue um, in a moment to chapter 10. But here it says, Now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda, there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, uh, and all the widows stood by weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out, knelt down and prayed, and turned to the body. He said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave uh, her hand, uh, her his hand and lifted her up. Uh, and when he had called the saints uh, and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. So uh, it was. He stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. So uh, the first thing we know is just the, this environmental change because we're talking about Peter while just leaving Jerusalem. I just want to mention there's a few Jewish people that live in Jerusalem at this time. And uh, that's his environment. That's, uh, that's all he knows. Uh, this is very different. He's over on the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, these are predominantly Gentile cities that have Jewish people living in them. He's still ministering to, uh, to Jewish people. Uh, but it's in a very different in, uh, environment. Uh, but it's in obedience to what God told him to do in terms of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18, to take the gospel into the whole world. Uh, in Acts 1, 8, he said, but the, you, shall, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. They were doing that in Judea, to kind of the surrounding areas right there, southern Israel, Samaria. They'd even done that, uh, and then the uttermost parts of the world. Hadn't quite done that, hadn't quite uh, been out of Jerusalem for a number of years uh, at this point. So we'd say his change in environment certainly was in obedience to, to the Lord. And secondly, uh, it involved these two miracles. And the first is in the town of Lydda, uh, today called Lot, which is the site of the uh, Tel Aviv airport. So when you uh, land in Tel Aviv uh, on a uh, trip to Israel, if you have the opportunity to do that someday, uh, you, as soon as you uh, touch down, you're already visiting a, a biblical site. It involved uh, this man, Aeneas, who apparently had been a quadriplegic for eight years. 
uh, and of course, uh, Peter comes in. We've already mentioned some miracles of note that, uh, that Peter has, uh, uh, has done, uh, and God is allowing him to do uh, uh, these miracles, uh, not to say that these same kind of miracles are not done uh, today, they absolutely are, uh, but in Peter's case, they just seem to be over the top, and I think it's for the reason to try to authenticate or substantiate the fact of who he was in terms of an apostle. You've got, you've got Jewish believers that have studied the scriptures for 2,000 years. So uh, how are they then to believe that something Peter writes is now equal with those scriptures? Uh, well, there had to be some authentication uh, to his words, and certainly these kinds of miracles uh, would certainly have, uh, have done that. Uh, we note that the miracle is instantaneous. Uh, the man gets up and, uh, and walks and, uh, and apparently everybody that he comes then into contact with, they know him, uh, and through his witness, many come to faith uh, in Christ. Uh, a tremendous miracle as he calls him to rise up uh, and walk. Uh, Chuck Swindoll uh, said this uh, about, uh, about it. He says, uh, this was really power. Some of us for years have been saying, arise and make up your bed to our teenagers with no results. <laughs> but uh, he's not able to say, arise and make up your bed. He's able to say, arise, make up your bed and actually uh, walk. So uh, keep praying uh, for the gift of miracles. You still may be successful uh, before they're grown and out of the house. Uh, second uh, miracle involved a woman in a nearby uh, town there on the Mediterranean of Joppa. It's about 10 miles away. An important city in terms of biblical history. This is also the city that, uh, uh, that Jonah leaves for uh, when he's on his run from God, when he boards a ship and heads, uh, uh, heads out of town. This is uh, the area that, uh, that he uh, actually departs from. Uh, we're introduced to her. Her name is uh, Tabitha in Hebrew, which means gazelle. Uh, certainly a, a term of grace. Uh, the Greek equivalent was uh, Dorcas. I'd go with the Hebrew if I were her. Uh, but uh, <laughs> evidently the name fits her pretty good because uh, a, a very gracious person as Peter gets there, uh, the widows are standing around displaying uh, the garments uh, that she's, uh, uh, she's done. So she's either a seamstress, she's, uh, she weaves, or she's uh, some combination. But uh, using her gifts and talents uh, for, for the Lord. She's somebody of significance uh, uh, in, in the church, uh, and that's, that's the point. Uh, we can all relate to this. Uh, we've lost a, a couple of guys here in the, in the church that were uh, intricate uh, you know, to the church. I think about John, and still picture him playing his piano, David back there uh, on the, uh, the sound and all that, and we know how we all felt when, when we lost him. That's the way this church is feeling. Uh, and so, hey, Peter, He's just a couple of miles away. Let's give it a shot. You know, so, they, so that's why they call for him. So tremendous faith. I mean, she's dead. I mean, they've washed the body. They're preparing. She's in, uh, put her in an upper room. They're in their time of mourning, and uh, they're going to get her in a tomb pretty quick. So that's why they're seen immediately. And then we notice that Peter, there's no hesitation uh, with him uh, 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 getting over there. Also interesting, uh, uh, again, uh, there's, there's the parallels of uh, these kinds of things and these kinds of miracles that uh, Peter had uh, witnessed himself at one time uh, using almost the same uh, words. Uh, Christ told a little girl who was dead to uh, rise and walk. Uh, Talitha kume, he said to her uh, in Hebrew. Uh, so here you've got Tabitha kume, right? Uh, very, very close even in, uh, in the language, something that... Uh, the Lord had done, and we see Peter arising uh, and bringing this young gal, uh, or th uh, this woman, uh, back uh, from the dead. This seems to be, again, what I call a momentum swing uh, in Peter's own heart in terms of what he's doing. Because now uh, he's not in Jerusalem. He's in a very, very Gentile city. He's seeing God work through him uh, in, uh, in the same way uh, and doing a very powerful miracle in terms of uh, raising uh, someone from the dead. And I don't think any of this is lost on him as he looks around uh, the environment and where he was. Uh, and uh, I just think of how gracious God is in, in dealing with, with Peter. I mean, Peter's, uh, I mean, we're going for some years now, uh, you know, as him being an apostle and sharing the gospel and, uh, and so forth, and one of the leaders certainly of the church and an apostle sent uh, primarily to, uh, to the Jews and so forth. Uh, he's seen what God did in Samaria that probably <laughs> tweaked him a little bit, uh, but he's, uh, he's still sorting through this whole thing. 
in his mind, uh, again, and, and in truth at this point in time, Christianity is another sect of Judaism. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the, the Zealots, and the Way. And the people of the Way were the ones that believed Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. They're just, Christianity at this point is limited to another sect uh, of Judaism. And he's trying to sort through it all. Now we know that God was working and there was some change. Uh, lastly, because uh, it, it was having an impact, we'd say, because that little note of him staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Now, we've mentioned this before, but a tanner, remember, is a guy that uh, worked with and touched often every day dead animals. Uh, that made him unclean in terms of Judaism. Couldn't go to synagogue, can't go to uh, a temple, uh, can't uh, practice the holidays, uh, nothing. Uh, he's uh, got to build his house. Uh, at least 75 feet outside of uh, any city, uh, and according to, according to a rabbinical uh, teaching, if a woman was engaged to a man and then later found out that he was a tanner, she could immediately break off the engagement, one of the few exceptions. So these guys are really the outcast of Judaism. Uh, and so for Peter, a good uh, kosher Jew, uh, to be staying uh, in his house, well, that's radical. I, I mean, I just don't know that we can really relate to this or whatever. Or uh, if you can think about uh, someone's home that you said you would never stay in and you're staying there. Uh, but that's exactly what's, uh, what's happening here. So we know that God <laughs> is having an impact upon Peter's life. Now we kind of shift the uh, ship, uh, shift focus to uh, uh, this centurion, Cornelius, in verse one of chapter ten, where God responds to uh, the prayers of this centurion. Uh, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian regiment, a devout man. We'll talk about what that means in a moment, and one who feared God with all of his household who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And uh, when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Uh, so he said to him, Your prayers and your arms, alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel spoke to him and had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants. And notice a devout soldier, uh, uh, the same description, uh, from among those who waited on him continually. Uh, so when he had explained all these things to them, uh, he sent them to Joppa. So uh, Caesarea is about um, 30 miles up the coast from, uh, from Tel Aviv. Uh, and it was, the, uh, it was the capital, basically. It was the Roman capital of, uh, of Judea and uh, a, very, a very Gentile city, uh, certainly. Uh, a city that, uh, that uh, again, if you do a tour of the Israel, it's really your first stop on the first day. And there's a, a beautiful amphitheater that's uh, there, Roman amphitheater. There's a beautiful, uh, basically, uh, the grandstands and what would have been the, uh, the racetrack for chariot races. Uh, you can see the architectural remains of, uh, uh, of the court where Paul would have stood to give his defense before Agrippa uh, and actually see the place where he would have departed from Rome. It's all, it's all in that area. It would have been a major Roman city uh, there in Judea, a very unlikely place that Peter would ever go to. Uh, we also note that the character of the centurion is, uh, is revealed in terms of who, who Cornelius was. Uh, again, he's, uh, he's a Roman soldier. He's, uh, he's an officer. Uh, he's over uh, possibly uh, anywhere from three to 600 men. Uh, and he is like the last guy that Peter would ever want to go to to share the gospel with. Because not only is he a Gentile, but he's a Roman officer. And they are living, and he has been living since he was a child under Roman occupation. These are not his favorite people. Uh, so this is, this is going to be a stretch, right? God will have to divinely intervene. And of course he will as we uh, go on in the text to get Peter to this guy's house. As a centurion, uh, again, we mentioned he'd be the equivalent to a, a non-commissioned officer. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, the fact that he was a devout man. Uh, that means that he is a convert to Judaism. And, uh, and there was two ways a Gentile could convert to Judaism. Uh, he could be called a proselyte of righteousness. means he, he's, he's fully, he's all in. Uh, and uh, he has become Jewish, basically. That means he's not only gone through all the rituals, uh, that, is, that means he's also been circumcised. Uh, he's going to follow the Mosaic law to the letter of the law. 
He's been born again, which is one of the terms associated with uh, coming into uh, Judaism. He's walked through the mikvah and he's been baptized in Jerusalem and so forth. Uh, that's, the, uh, again, a proselyte of righteousness. Uh, that, though, is not what, uh, what Cornelius has done. He's referred to as a proselyte at the gate. In other words, he's come to faith that believed that there was the, the God of Judaism is the one true God. Uh, and he's uh, uh, praised to God on a regular basis. He, he follows and practices many of the practices uh, of, uh, of Judaism and so forth. Uh, and he's agreed to seven precepts that he will keep in his life. One is that he would never blaspheme. He would never be involved in idolatry. He would never commit murder. He would never commit incest. He would never steal. He would never be disobedient to authorities. And he would never eat flesh with the blood in it. And, uh, and again, that becomes uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting commands, at least a, a portion of it, the idea of it, given in Acts 15 in terms of all Gentiles and our eating habits and so forth. And we'll look at that more in detail when we get to Acts 15. But that certainly has a has a play in, in, uh, in uh, Peter's life and his kosher diet and the illustration that God's going to give him in a moment. But uh, Cornelius, he's, uh, he's a man that uh, is seeking after God and the truth uh, about God. He's come to faith in the God of, of, uh, of the Jews. He's a religious man. He gives generously. He prays at 3 in the afternoon, which is the time of the evening sacrifice. He knows what time it is. He knows in Jerusalem the evening sacrifice is going on. He's probably on his knees like Daniel was and faces Jerusalem uh, and prays uh, every day on that uh, particular occasion. Uh, notice he's a family leader. Notice uh, he, he feared God and his household. So he's uh, his wife. He's bringing his children up into his uh, newly embraced faith. Uh, and as I mentioned, one of the soldiers that he will send down has the same uh, category. Uh, he is a devout man also. Uh, he's the same type of convert to Judaism. So he's a man that's having an influence over other men as well. He's generous. He's giving. He's a man of integrity. And he's seeking after the truth of God. Uh, and we would say, secondly, the prayer of the centurion is answered. Notice what the angel says. Your prayers... Uh, and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Uh, 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 memorial or remembrance is the same word used in the uh, uh, book of Leviticus for a meal offering. So the indication is that your prayers and what you're praying have arisen like a sweet aroma to God. This kind of rocks our theological world sometimes to think that God is, is listening and hearing and answering the prayer of a Gentile. Uh, and again, which kind of begs the question, uh, not only of a Gentile, but a non-believer. He's not come to faith in Jesus Christ yet. We sometimes wonder, does God hear the prayer of, of the non-believer? Well, uh, he did in this case, and he does in some other cases in the Bible as well. And of course, he always hears the prayer of the non-believer crying out for mercy and grace and, uh, and to uh, uh, come to know God and so forth. A lot of people have prayed, Lord, if you're re really there, then you know, show me, reveal yourself. And, and of course, God is uh, more than happy to answer uh, those particular prayers. What was his prayer? We don't know. Was it, should I fully enter into Judaism? Should I do that? I'm at this point. Should I, should I go, uh, go all the way here? Uh, maybe that was his prayer to God. Maybe he's heard the preaching of Philip. Philip's in the area. Uh, Philip the evangelist is, uh, is in this particular town. Maybe he's heard the message of Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> is he really the Messiah? Uh, well, we don't know exactly what his prayer was, but no, he was seeking after God, uh, and he was seeking after uh, uh, the truth of God, <clears throat> as we kind of illustrated with the, uh, the history of the gospel coming here to the Hawaiian Islands. You had people that were seeking after the truth of God the best they could. Uh, and based on that, then God brought them further revelation. As we said, that scene's been repeated many times around the world. But, but uh, John records this in John 3.20. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So that's uh, one group of people. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they're into evil. Uh, they could care less about the light or the truth or knowing God. And they don't want to even want to come near it because their deeds were exposed. Verse 21, but, term of great contrast, in great contrast to that, he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, uh, that they may have been done uh, in God. Cornelius is a guy who is doing the truth, and therefore he is coming into the light. Uh, 
as, uh, as he uh, basically responds to the light or the truth about God to his own life, and he responds in a positive way in faith and so forth, then even more is being given to him. And, of course, that's going to conclude with Peter's message given in his house uh, that we'll look at next week. So uh, God's dealing with Peter. He needed an attitude change. Uh, he changed his environment to be able to do that. Uh, but God is working at the other end in the life of this centurion who's going to be obedient now to what God has asked him to do. In fact, send uh, the, uh, this uh, other devout soldier uh, along with uh, two other servants to the home of Simon the Tanner. Uh, let's go back to Peter. His attitude needed, uh, as we mentioned, some heavenly clarification. That's in verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Uh, then he became very hungry and was thinking about In-N-Out Burger. No, it's probably not in your text. And wanted to eat, but while they were made ready, he fell into a, a trance. Uh, and saw heaven open. See, I usually eat and then I fall into the trance. Uh, it's not usually before I eat. That's a little different here. And he, and he saw heaven open in an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him uh, and led set down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, uh, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up uh, into heaven again. Seems to be a lot of threes in Peter's life for some reason. If God wants to get Peter's attention, we're going to tell him three times. A little, little hard-headed here. But uh, again, uh, very interesting that, uh, that God is, uh, is doing this as opposed to Philip's already in the city. Why not just send Philip over to preach the gospel? Uh, why get Peter up there? Uh, Paul's, Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. Why don't you uh, uh, speak to Paul and get him over there? I think because God cares about Peter uh, and changing the heart of Peter. Uh, because Peter needs to get convinced that the gospel needs to go to the whole world. Uh, when they have this big powwow in Acts chapter 15, trying to figure out what to do about uh, Paul's preaching to all these Gentiles and them coming to faith in Christ. Uh, and, of course, the, the guys back in, in Jerusalem are just kind of the exception. That's awesome. All they got to do now is convert to Judaism, and then they can come to faith uh, in our Jewish Messiah is what they're thinking. Uh, but Peter has got a loud voice as the big fisherman, but he's got a voice of authority uh, somewhat. Uh, and, uh, and he's able to lend his voice and his experiences, we'll see, uh, to what Paul has to say as well. And we'll listen to uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, kind of give the final pronouncement then uh, in terms of that counsel. But Peter's a critical guy. I think God cares about his own heart. He's going to make an attitude adjustment so that Peter, uh, wherever he went, yes, he was the apostle to the Jews. Did he preach the gospel to Gentiles also? Absolutely. Where does the guy die? Pretty Gentile city called Rome. Uh, he's out there preaching the gospel. Paul, likewise, is the apostle to the Gentiles. Where does Paul go every time he enters a city? Synagogue. Uh, you know, uh, these guys had separate callings, but uh, who they shared with was ne never limited. And, uh, and that's a lesson for us as well. We can start to think that uh, I'm, I'm, I'll probably only be able to share my faith with people that are like me or my age or my interest or whatever, and nothing could be further from, from the truth. Calvary Chapel is based on that, that idea. Take an older guy with a bald head, Chuck Smith, and have him be the guy that reaches all these hippie kids that all look like they came off Duck Dynasty. Yeah. <laughs> but that's who God used. He didn't look like him. He didn't talk like him, although he started talking like him after a while. Uh, and uh, I couldn't stand the music, though I think he started liking the music a after a while. Uh, but, you know, God, God wants us to reach, uh, reach everyone. And that's part of the story here with, uh, with Peter. And so what he does is he gives them this vision that's centered around food. Uh, it's a sheet. It appears like a sheet. It's not a sheet, but it's like a, a sheet. Uh, it's, uh, it's let down with the four corners, uh, again, representing the four corners of the world. Uh, it's got uh, kosher animals, uh, clean. Uh, it's got unclean uh, animals in it, uh, apparently. They're all mixed together. Uh, and, of course, uh, when uh, Peter sees it, verse 14, 
uh, after the command to kill and eat, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And then the voice spoke to him a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Uh, God is not talking to Peter about food. Uh, Peter's diet actually never changes. He remains kosher as uh, most Jews today, as most Jewish Christians remain uh, any kosher uh, today as well. This is really not about food. Uh, it's a symbolism. Peter's going to explain it later when he gets to the house of Cornelius uh, in verse 28, where he says, then he said to them, you know how it's unlawful uh, for, uh, it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to uh, one of another nation, the Goim or Gentiles. But God has shown me that I should not call what is any man common or unclean. Uh, that's what's represented in the sheet. Uh, there's men that are Jewish, men that are not Jewish, people from uh, uh, different places around the world. Uh, and God is saying, what I've called clean, don't you dare call unclean. And how is he going to clean them? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Gentiles are going to get saved in the same way that uh, believing Jews uh, get saved. Uh, verse 29, he says, Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked them, For what reason have you, uh, have you sent me? That's the lesson. That's the lesson for Peter. Uh, it wasn't an issue of food, but the food was an illustration of how people were separated. Again, the Jews were separated in many ways. The sign of their covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was the Shabbat or the Sabbath to worship on a particular, particular, particular day. But it was also in their diet. Back in Leviticus 20:25, 20, uh, there Moses writing, "You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean." See our same kind of terminology between unclean birds and clean. You shall not t uh, make yourself abominable by the beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean, and you shall be holy to me, belong to me, for I am the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples uh, that you should be mine. Uh, again, it's, uh, now, uh, are Jewish believers today uh, somehow have to be kosher? No, not at all. They're under the new covenant, just like uh, you and I are. We celebrate that covenant with the sign of the covenant, which is the, the cup and the bread that we take in what we call uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, it's the same. We're all under the same covenant. But you can imagine for them, they're trying to win to faith in Christ, their families, uh, their brothers and sisters, their moms and their dads, uh, the people they grew up with. Uh, and it doesn't help if they insult them by what they eat right off, right off the bat. Uh, that, that's only going to make sense. So uh, when they... A lot of them, most of them, eat kosher, uh, not because they have to. It's because, well, there's a little part of this that says, I'm pretty sure I need to do this. But they understand grace, but they're trying to reach. Uh, they eat kosher out of love and out of a desire for evangelism. Uh, they don't exercise the freedom that uh, maybe they have uh, because, for the sake of their brethren, that they might win others to faith in Christ. And certainly uh, that principle applies to us as, as well. I remember having David Hawking out on one of the men's retreats several years ago, and uh, I can't always control exactly what we're uh, what we're eating, what we're being see served. You can feed a couple hundred guys, you know, and um, you know we were okay. I think we had teriyaki chicken the first night, but sure enough, here we are. We've got fried rice, eggs. We're still okay. Ham. <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry. And I I watched David. He was sitting next to me just out of curiosity. And of course, he uh, he didn't eat it at all. And I think because he didn't, I probably didn't either. And, uh, uh, and I know he's thinking about it. He doesn't know who's there. He doesn't know who's watching him. Uh, and there's certainly a high probability there could be a couple of Jewish believers that are out there. You've got a couple of hundred guys. Uh, but, uh, and then a couple of years later, last time he was here, we went uh, and he, uh, I think, after the whole prophecy conference, we had, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the two Sunday morning services and all that. And uh, I'm pretty well spent by the time all that stuff is done. We went over to, uh, to when Sizzler was still there. Uh, and I wanted some comfort food at that point, you know, fried rice and eggs. And, uh, and I forgot that it came with Portuguese sausage. And uh, so he's like, I, I didn't even have to look his way. I felt his stare uh, at my plate. I could feel it. Like, it was almost an audible noise that he had my Portuguese sausage and oh gee, you know, I was just hungry. <laughs> I was ready to be in the trance after I, I ate. And, uh, so he, uh, I look at him and he says, you're not going to eat that, are you? You know, which I knew was coming. So I, I, uh, 
I just told him, well, you know, there's, uh, there's four slices on the plate, and I'm only a quarter Jewish, so I'm going to sit this one on the side. The Gentile part of me is going to eat the other three. <laughs> I don't think he thought it was funny. But, <laughs> but uh, there's only, uh, only one other way to, ha- to handle those uh, breakfast meats. I had uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum for a couple of classes, and uh, who was Jewish, I have him for a couple of classes in graduate school. And uh, he said there's one, one way you can handle uh, uh, breakfast uh, with a Jewish friend. Uh, if you're having something like that, it just says, just have bacon and then fry the hell out of it. That's, that's according to Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. But, uh, crispy is the ticket, apparently. But, uh, it's an issue. It's still an issue today. It was a huge issue uh, here in this day. So God takes something that's a big issue, uh, like food, and tries to use it to teach uh, a principle to uh, uh, to Peter. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, he does. Uh, he does get it, uh, and uh, uh, and we're we're thankful for it. Uh, in terms of uh, a couple of principles for us, uh, because uh, there, there's it's just not uh, Jewish believers that get hung up, but there, there's other other people that get hung up on this thing of uh, eating and what you can eat and so forth. Uh, but uh, just to summarize a few points, one is uh, what we eat doesn't give us favor with God. Has has nothing to do with it. Jesus says it's not it's not what goes in you that defiles you. It's what comes out, because it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. The problem is not what I'm eating. The problem is what's going on in my heart and mind, and uh, it comes out of, out of my mouth. Uh, so what I, what I keep from me, and of course there's uh, uh, you know the whole group. Uh, there's a whole Protestant denomination that doesn't eat meat because somehow they and they teach and believe that gives them. Uh, favor with God. Uh, that's not biblical. That's not true. Uh, it's also not true that uh, that we cannot eat certain things to prevent death. Uh, again, Hebrews 9.27 uh, says it's appointed for men to die once, and after that the judgment. We're all going to go on time. You know, there's uh, there's been several uh, famous authors um, that uh, of, uh, of uh, health food books and cookbooks and so forth. Uh, that eat these uh, very explicit diets, vegetarian, vegans, and so forth, that have died of cancer. I mean, that's just, uh, uh, you, you can't do anything to add to the length of your life. You can add to the quality of your life by your diet and exercise and so forth. But everybody's going to go on time. Nobody's going to get to heaven one day, and the Lord's going to go, man, where have you been? Like, I thought you were going to be up here 20 years ago. Good diet, good diet. You know, it's like, oh, awesome. I didn't even know you could do that. I'm sorry. God's not going to do that. Uh, it's, it's appointed for what's man to die. Uh, and then the judgment. Uh, you can, uh, it helps, you know, add to the quality of your life, uh, but not to the length of your life. Uh, and three, uh, what we eat cannot give us eternal life. Uh, and so it doesn't matter what your diet is. Uh, we all need to come to Jesus, who is uh, the bread of life. And John chapter 6 uh, one of the great I am statements that, uh, that he builds uh, around uh, who Jesus is. Jesus there says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. That one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, uh, he will live forever. Jesus is what we need. He is the I am. He is the eternal God. Uh, and in John, using those seven I am statements, fills in that blank that we can understand who God is to us. The very thing that would give them, in their minds, absolute nourishment in that Middle Eastern culture was bread. Without it, they're not going to survive. He says, I'm that to you. I'm everything that you need. And if you come to me uh, and uh, receive what I have for you, uh, you can have eternal life. That, that is the bread you can eat uh, and live, live forever. Uh, Peter's vision, secondly, involved clarification of the gospel, which we've already alluded to. The four corners of the sheep, again, four corners of the world. And again, this was all just uh, meant to be an illustration to Peter. To Peter, one he certainly never forgot. He spoke of it uh, uh, in his writings on, on more than one occasion. Uh, and without this uh, revelation to Peter, this clarification... Uh, what uh, the gospel going into the world in the first century would have been greatly altered uh, and would have been very different uh, than it was. And, uh, but we, so we can be thankful for this particular vision to Peter, uh, his experience in the house of Cornelius. We'll look at next week and then what he has to say uh, in Acts chapter 15. Dr. Harry Einstein was one of the great preachers of a couple of generations ago. And one of his commentaries mentions the story of the passing of his own father. 
And he said when his father was getting weaker and, uh, and having trouble speaking, he actually quoted from this passage here. And he, he said several times, a great sheet, wild beast, and, and, and he, he just couldn't get the rest out. And after about the third time, one of his friends uh, leaned over to him and said, John, it says creeping things. Oh, yes, he said. That is how I got in. Just a poor, good-for-nothing, creeping thing. But I got in. Because the people in the sheep are people. It's not, it's not the food. It's not the animals. Uh, it's, uh, it's God's uh, grace that he's going to show to all mankind. And there had to be a change in the apostolic attitudes uh, if that was going to, uh, to happen. Again, Peter's been praying uh, uh, for, uh, with this vision. Uh, his attitude, uh, again, has not probably been the best at this point, uh, but it's been changing. Uh, and let's see how it's challenged then by his very unlikely visitors in verse 17 to 23. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision, uh, which he had uh, seen, meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and they called and asked Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging theirs. Uh, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to meet uh, to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? Uh, and they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in uh, and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So Peter's given this command by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, to, uh, uh, to follow them. Notice the phrase, uh, uh, nothing doubting or making no distinction. This is important because... Um, uh, when these guys show up at the door, again, it says uh, three Gentiles. And notice they come to the gate. They're not coming in. They're not even approaching the, the gate of the yard to the, to the house. And it wasn't because Simon the Tanner had a couple of big pit bulls out there. That's not why. There's some, some homes in Ka'ava. You better just go to the gate and call out. But uh, uh, they, won't, they won't cross over because they don't want to offend uh, Simon or, or Peter. Uh, it's obviously very, very known uh, to these men not to do that. So they call out. Peter's up there. The vision is done. God's perfect timing. By the way, Peter, three guys are going to show up and don't make any distinction. Just go with them. Don't make any distinction in what? The fact that they're not Jewish. Yeah, you, you, get, you know, if, if God doesn't tell him right then as he's pondering the vision and still trying to, trying to figure out, you have to kind of wonder what he would do next uh, and how he would receive them and so forth. Uh, and Peter is walking into new territory. Uh, he's about ready to do something he has never done before. You know, the Bible says to trust in, uh, trust in the Lord in all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll uh, direct your path. And that's exactly what Peter uh, is doing. It's kind of hard sometimes when God asks you to do something you've never done before and never considered to do. I mean, we kind of look at this, ah, just three guys, go talk to them. But it was a huge, it was a huge deal. And, uh, uh, and yet he's, uh, he's obedient. It's a, it's a step of faith. The writer of Hebrews says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And Peter couldn't see it, but uh, he was trusting the Lord at this point. Uh, and we'd say, secondly, it was a challenge for him to welcome these new guests uh, into their home. Uh, and again, we would say uh, to his new guests, no vision, no aloha. <laughs> if God doesn't give them this vision and God doesn't speak to them, no aloha. He, Peter's not coming out going, oh, bro, come, in my house. He's not saying anything. He's like, uh, you know, I gave it the office or something, you know. It's like, don't bother me. Uh, but uh, he, it's amazing. Uh, he invites these guys in. So as the sun sets on the Mediterranean, in the home of Simon the Tanner dwells, Peter the apostle, along with a, another Roman soldier and two Gentile servants. It's a pretty unlikely group, group of guys. Uh, that, are, uh, that are there together. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty amazing, you know, what, uh, what God is, uh, is doing here. Uh, and you have to wonder uh, if some of these scriptures that Peter has actually preached himself are coming back to him now in these moments of trying to figure out what in the world God is doing. 
Uh, and when he preached his first sermon on uh, Pentecost in Acts 2, he quotes Joel in verse 17, and he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit, spirit on all people. All people. I'm sure as he said that to that Jewish crowd, he meant all Jewish, all Jewish people. But uh, it doesn't say that. It's all, all people. The promise to Abraham that uh, I will make uh, you a blessing to all the goyim, all the nations, all the Gentiles. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's about ready to, uh, to happen. Now, of course, the door has been opened to the Samaritans. It's going to get open to the rest of the Roman world here uh, through this vision, through the obedience of, uh, of Pe uh, Peter. Now, the, uh, the application for us is pretty, pretty straightforward. If God gave you the vision and the sheet was let down, what's in it? What's in it that you would say, not so, Lord? When he says, welcome and love, what's in it? Not so, Lord. What's in it? Is it a particular person or group of people or kind of people or a segment of our, of our culture? As he lets it down, is it? Is it all the homeless people that live under the bridge in Kaneohe? I mean, so who's in it? But, but that's the application. For us to pray and ask God, if I had that vision today, and, and you showed me who's in it, is there someone that I would say not Lord? Now we, we kind of you know, talk about that, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, well, their contradiction. He says, not so, but then he calls him Lord. Let's keep in mind who we're talking about. Peter is a very godly man. He loves God. God's using him. He just raised the dead. God's using him in a powerful way. It doesn't mean he's got it all together. It doesn't mean that there isn't something that needs to be changed uh, in his own heart, his own attitude towards a group of people. Uh, most of the people in the world, actually, at the time, uh, a whole group of people. Uh, that says that we can be walking with the Lord, loving God, and have a healthy relationship with God. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't want to, like we do with our kids sometimes, grab them by the shoulders and go, hey, you need to change your attitude. Uh, and God does that sometimes. Uh, we need to be open to allowing him to do that. Uh, and even when we would say, not so, Lord, uh, we have to say, not so, Lord, but, you know, I'm willing. You know, I, I get it. And I, I know that there needs to be a change, uh, and I'm willing. You know that that's our part. You know it's God's part. God's part to change the heart. We're, none of us are, are great at heart surgery spiritually, and uh, but uh, God's pretty good at it if we're willing. But He never goes against our will. So even if we were to say not so, let's say not so. But Lord, have at it, because I'm willing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, let's pray. Lord. my soul at rest in him comes my salvation he
Just like 